Hello, and my name is Pete Rushmer, and I'm your host today of A Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success, or you're already smashing it, but want to continue to level up, we are here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS, and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. James, how are you, mate? I'm right, mate. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. Really good. So to the listeners, I'm joined today by James McPherson, who is uh, heads up the brand Rebranding Safety and um, also Risk Fluent as well. Um, absolute superstar, James. is. He's got a much more successful podcast and YouTube channel than me. So I feel honoured to have you on the show, <laughs> mate. Absolutely honoured. Um, I've given you a bit of an intro, but I don't know. What did I miss, mate? What did I miss for the listeners? Not much, really. That's it. <laughs> That's pretty much that's pretty much it. Um, I was I was once introduced to the, on the keynote as a as a YouTuber, which I'm not sure I felt comfortable with at the time. I'm getting more comfortable with it now, if I'm honest. Uh, but that was nice. Um, but yeah, I've been a safety professional for about ten years, and then I kind of specialised in starting to specialise in like the more cultural stuff and the more kind of human behaviour stuff. Um, and, and probably fire safety as well was probably my big specialist area. And we started the podcast about three years ago. YouTube came about a year later-ish. Um, and that's it. And now we're full-time offering consultancy and chatting shit on the... Um, oh, sorry, we're allowed to swear on your podcast. You, mate, you can say what you like, don't worry about it. Oh, I'm so used to just doing... <laughs> no, 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 seriously, mine's much the same. We're, we're relaxed, don't worry. Ooh, that's good. Well, <laughs> I just thought I, I should have asked that question before, shouldn't I? No, 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 that's yeah. cool. So you tell... Yeah, and that's it, really. So a lot of the people who listen to uh, a half dozen things podcast, some of them will be interested in safety and some of them will be like sort of transport people. And yeah. the thing, the thing that I love about the, the fleet sector, which we operate in is that we, we touch so much the, the role of the people we look after touches so much on safety, touches so much on people and HR as well. Um, so it's a really nice broad role. That's a position of responsibility in the fleet sector. And I think, do you know what? I just love the idea of having you on here talking about safety um, and, and particularly around compliance as well, because compliance is a massively sort of used word in the sector. Compliance is used a lot more than safety because of the regulations around yeah. uh, operating and the operators licensing um, in the UK. Obviously, we're, you know, the, um, the regulators, the office of the traffic commissioner. And there's the set of regulations of which we have to have to stick to. But I quite regularly ask what people think is obtuse questions like, for example, yeah, it's compliant, but is it safe? And people are going to me like, well, yeah, it's safe if it's, if it's compliant. And I'm like, hang on, that, that driver can drive for 10 hours on that day compliantly, but is it safe for him to drive 10 hours? Mm. And everyone looks at me like I'm baffled. <laughs> Mm. like I'm baffling them but anyway these are some big questions and we're going to be tackling some of them today as well so um I'm really really excited and people will think Pete's prime James for this but actually I haven't at all um James <laughs> has prepared James has prepared these questions and actually these are the questions we're going to be discussing rather than having six points to talk about for example we've actually got six questions so kicking it off straight in there is compliance safe James when you say prepared the questions, I, I literally just, I was like, oh, six questions. Fucking hell, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That'll do. There you go. Send them. So, like, Bosh, I, let's do them. Let's do I them. Mate. I think they're brilliant. I haven't gone over this, like, in like, and, and finally manicured it to lead into like a business advert. So, hopefully, people get something out of this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll get plenty from your podcast. We're going to point them towards that later as well, because I'm sure yeah, people will go yeah. and listen. Right, let me answer your question. You know, I, to be honest, is there even an answer to it? Is is compliance safe? Yes, sometimes. Is compliance unsafe? Yes, sometimes. Um, I think it it depends how you approach compliance. It's like to your your attitude to it is really really important. So, automatically, if your main driver is to be purely compliant. Then, then it's probably not going to be safe. I think the best example would be fire. Probably a lot of my examples might be fire because um, I've done so much work in fire. Um, and with Grenfell and everything that's coming out the back of that, there is so much rich data and, and, and evidence that, that we can use to learn from. Um, and Jill Koenig 
talked about this really nicely in the podcast that we, the conversation we had with her, but also her podcast and her book, um, which is called Catastrophe. Um, so check that out. I'll send you a link, Pete, if you want to link it on the on the stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. Jill Kernick and that's Kernick, Catastrophe. Yeah. And catastrophe. So her podcast is really good. The podcast is kind of complementary material to her book. But anyway, um, so she, she kind of t- touches on it really well in there and, and ultimately comes down to the point of saying that compliance is not an automatic precursor for safety. And and fire is such a good example of that. So I'll kind of maybe give a story to, to put it into context. So when I used to work in housing and after banging the drum for many years to try and get ourselves into the design meeting, there's so many times we would get given a, a block of flats or a care home or something that had just been built and be like, right, go and do your fire risk assessment. And we're like, oh man, if you'd have just involved us at the beginning, we could have solved all these problems before we started. And now we've built the bugger, like what are we going to do with it now? So it was always this horrible relationship between us and construction and oh, it was a nightmare. So we finally got invited to the design stage and we had a, a, a block of flats. It was about, it wasn't, it wasn't a high rise, probably like a, a low rise. And I had um, was a gorgeous block of flats. Central London had uh, a wheelchair user flat, so an accessibility flat uh, on the third floor, third or second floor, I think it was. Um, so it was primed for a wheelchair user. It was designed for a wheelchair user. Um, and, and my question was always from a fire risk assessment point of view. So I'm not building the building. They have their own challenges and their own pressures. My job is literally is, is if there's a fire, will we know about it? And if there's a fire, can we get out? Um, the two things that I'm trying to work out, right? So I asked that question, if there's a fire, will we know about it? That's a different conversation. And, and yes, we could, but if there's a fire, can we get out? And I said, this person in a wheelchair and is on the second floor. I've got a bit of a problem now. Right. So can he get out? So I asked the architect, how does this person get out of the building? Oh, I stay put. Right. Okay. But stay put doesn't apply if the fire's in your flat. If the fire's in your flat, you don't stay put. You get fucking get out. Like there's a fire in your flat. So there was a misconception around stay put as well, which complicated the issue. Um, but he was like, all right, stay put, stay put. And I was like, yeah, but the fire's in his flat. So he's not going to sit there, is he? And wait for the fire. He's going to get out. He or she's going to, going to get out. And where, where are they going to go at that point? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so we, oh. um, but the building is compliant, James. I'm like, right. Okay. So have you got an evacuation lift? So there's different types of lift. You've got a normal lift, which will shut down when you're, when there's a fire, but you'll know, or they might not shut down. We just tell you not to use them um, because they're not kind of protected essentially. Then you get fire fighting lifts that the fire service will use to help them fire, not technically an evacuation lift. Then you get an evacuation lift. Sometimes the, the last two are one and the same, um, but you get an evacuation lift that is designed for to use in an evacuation. Do we have a firefighting slash evacuation lift? Uh, no, we don't. We don't need one because the building's not tall enough. So it's not legally required in building regs. All right. Okay, cool. So he kept coming back to me. The building's compliant, James. I said, yes, the building's compliant, but I've got, a, I've got a person in a wheelchair in a building that's on fire. They cannot get out. They're stuck on flat, flat uh, floor two. So how are they going to get out? Yeah, but the building's compliant. And we just kept coming back around to this point, wrapped around to it, and we finally got to the point where he kind of, the whites of his eyes came around as he realised, and, and I was like, oh, right, so it's different. Safe and compliant, in, in particularly in building design, was very different. Um, and I think there's examples of that all over the place. I think the HSE have, uh, have published a research paper a, a few years ago that said, in their scientific department that showed that manual handling training traditionally as we've done it um, doesn't improve techniques and it doesn't reduce, doesn't show evidence to reduce um, injury. But yet we're all legally required most of the time to deliver training. When I challenged the HSE on that in a previous role, I was head of safety for a trade association. So we had a really good relationship with the, with, uh, with the enforcer, the HSE. And, and I said to him, you know, what, what are we going to do about this? Your science division have said, the training doesn't work. That's basically what this paper says. Training doesn't work for manual handling. So what am I going to do about it? Do, am I going to be telling my members and now customers um, they need to be focused on strength and condition training, which is what that paper said. You're, you're more likely to get uh, reduced injuries by strength and condition training. And they said, right, if we turn up and you're not doing manual handling training, we will enforce. So again, 
even in their own department, compliant is very different from safe. However, what I will say is, and this is where our good friend, uh, Monty, your good friend Colin, comes at this from a different perspective, in that it really depends on how you come at this. If you are ultimately compliant with the Health and Safety at Work Act, you only need to do what's reasonable and practicable. So you don't need to be 100% safe. So your perception of safe is different from my perception of safe. So when we ask like those real simple questions of is compliance safe, well, we first need to define safe as well, which then we end up in more philosophical conversations and it becomes a nightmare and my brain hurts and your brain hurts and, and we've not got anywhere. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, if you, if you follow the, the legislation to its, to its intent and not to the to its word if that makes sense so uh, during covid um what's her name the top lady of uh, of the scottish government i can't remember her name oh nicola sturgeon nicola sturgeon that's it thank you she said something that i really like she said you know during this pandemic we need people to follow the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law which i thought was really nice so if you were to look at particularly health and safety legislation and follow the spirit of that legislation, you'll probably be compliant and pretty safe. If you were to follow the letter of the law, you could likely be compliant and not safe, in my opinion. If that that would probably be how I would come at it. But it's a it's a messy question to be fair. I shouldn't have wrote it in that thing and give it to you because <laughs> We could talk about you, that for about two hours. Are you, are you regretting it? It's all. Yeah. I, I, I'm. I'm really tempted to go. Okay, so what, what is safe then, James? Oh, <laughs> and that that is ultimately a question I I have for a lot of people. Like like so, I used to call this thing called training brain. So when I would deliver training people seem to be in a different mindset in training room. They demand real high standards of safety when they're in the training room because they think that me as a trainer, that's what I want to hear. But it's not. I want to hear something that's going to work. That's very different from the highest standard. Normally, we're probably pretty low or middle. Um, and people really want a high standard of safety. But, yeah, what what is safe? Safe for me is extremely different. And that's why I get really uncomfortable with people that, like, safety first, like, Okay, I get I get the spirit of that. I understand what you're trying to do as an aspiration, but what's safe? I'm telling you now, I would put my life on the line if it meant to keep a roof over my my wife and daughter's head and put food on their on their table. I would I would risk my life for that. And many, many men and women do around the world. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't have police force, military, you know, all of those people put their life on the line every day. Is that safe? No, is skydiving safe? People do it for a hobby. Rock climbing, is that safe? No. So yeah, that question could go down a really deep rabbit hole, <laughs> really deep rabbit hole. And compliance is what ultimately guides us to say what is safe as well, mm -hmm. which is where it gets really messy. And, and we, you know, I, I agree. I think we're getting really philosophical here. I, there, there needs to be a set of legislation and regulation, particularly, you know, okay. if, I, if, if I sort of draw this background to the fleet sector, which we operate in, the, those regulations that are upheld by the traffic commissioner are necessary. And I think we, we're absolutely not saying that they're not necessary because they are and people need to have guiding principles and um, many people will need the to follow the letter of that law um, to, to help support that but at the same time I think it is useful to, to to shake things up a little bit and really think and hopefully people will go away from this podcast and start thinking actually is that you know is this safe and just start to think a little bit more about it rather than rolling their eyes and going them safety people gone mad again. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, that is literally what I'm trying not to do. Um, yeah. I, th I think what's really helpful here is 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 some is is separating the two, but but not not in a negative way. Like so, particularly in the fleet sector, like you guys have got your own set of really kind of strict legal requirements, right? That you've got to do. Mm -hmm. So that is straight up compliance, right? That will overlap a lot with with safety. So there are aspects of being compliant that will that will one hundred percent create a safer environment. It will, you know, speed limits, for example, create a safer environment. But is it safe? Again, like I get hit by a lorry at twenty miles an hour, like still gonna fucking hurt. Do you know what I mean? Like I still don't want to do it. So is it safe? No, it's not. Real. But I think it's helpful when we go. What are we trying to achieve here? I've, our primary aim right now is to be compliant, is, is understanding that that may not necessarily mean that we are safe. 
But if we can just understand that 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 is a separation, a slight one, but but still a separation nonetheless, I think that's really helpful and really powerful. If we can just say, we're trying to achieve compliance today, that's fine, because we all need to be compliant, otherwise we're bust, right? We've still got to survive as a business. But then ultimately, we've also got to protect people from harm morally. We want to do that. Most of us want to do that. It's good for our business to do that. It's good for our cultures to do that. So we just go, is it safe though? Just ask that question, and it might be, but it's good to ask that question. So I think it's it's not saying it's one or the other. It's just saying that they're not necessarily direct precursors of of each other because you can be you could be one hundred percent safe, but try and prove that to a insurer or a regulator might be really hard because you could just be really safe because you've got an epic team and they're really high performing and they're great. And I don't want to slow them down with recording that and evidence in that on piece of the paper, therefore proving safe uh, uh, compliance or proving safety might be really hard. Yeah. So that's such a great point. Such a, such a great point. You know, we deal with some really small businesses where, you know, you might only have a team of five drivers and they might be the absolute best drivers. They, yeah. you know, they, they do absolutely everything by the book um, and that they are the safest team, best drivers, best fuel efficiency. These guys are really experienced, but ultimately they could be non They could then also be non-compliant and unable to prove to a regulator that they're compliant, even though they are actually safe because, you know, the documentation's not in place. Yeah. You know, it's, um, yeah, baffling. Good, 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 good thought, though, that essentially one and the other are not the same and essentially need to be con- considered independently. One may lead to the other, but potentially they are independent independent things. Brilliant. Um, so I guess that leads me on to the second question, which you suggested. And I know we've talked about it a little bit, but how do we balance compliance and safety? Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. I think for me, it's just it's just understanding that separation is probably the first thing. Um, um, but I think as as well, if we can understand that separation, then we can ask the question. Like I said a minute ago, what are we trying to achieve? I think that's really really important, and it would be really refreshing for me if I went to a customer and they're like, actually, James, my primary focus right now is not safety. Um, it's this task, this particular task, is just about compliance. Whether it's Rams, for example. You know, we've we've all had contractor RAM sent through and gone, well, this is crap. This has got no indication of like whether it's safe or not. It is just what it is. It's it's a form of demonstrating that they're doing something. Um, okay, fine. That's fine. But ultimately, it needs to reflect the reality of work at some point. And they might be two different processes. They might be the same. I found that normally when they come in the same, they they kind of conflict with each other because operations is quick moving it's dynamic it's fast it it keeps going and going and going and we haven't got time to write shit down we haven't got time to do checklists we're just cracking on cracking on cracking on it's particularly like the, the, every year goes by operations just seem to be quicker and quicker and you know, like look at amazon man i can order something now and it turned up tomorrow like what the fuck it's just like so there is no way that safety and compliance is is a massive driver in that process because those two are ultimately quite slow. They're slower. So then they're kind of inefficient in a way. Now, I actually used to say that efficiency and safety were the same thing. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with that now, but if you zoom out, it's inefficient as a company to be unsafe because you'll lose people. You might have a high turnover of staff or whatever. But if you zoom in with the operation role, 100%. Being thorough, as Eric Honag or the academic would call it, versus efficiency, they're, they're two different things. Mm-hmm. So I, I just think understanding that there's a there's a, maybe a bit of a trade off there. Having that that question in your head, being like, okay, is it safe? Um, will will help you. There is a paper called the Safety of Work and the Work of Safety, which you can get free of charge off Google which is good for an academic paper. Normally they're behind a paywall um, that, that breaks kind of, you've got separate things. They call it the safety of work. So e.g. the safety of real work, actual uh, work. So how people are actually safe, their behaviors and then safety work. And they break that down into four, four categories. And I think this is a really kind of undervalued paper. I think it's like huge. I think it's really helpful if people can really understand it. So, so there's one 
One is physical safety, easiest one, really simple, hard hat, PPE, guarding, things that are physical, right? Physical safety, that's dead easy. Admin safety will be our policies, procedures, risk assessments, and things like that, right? That create like an admin foundation of rules and guidance within our organization to try and influence the behaviors. So it creates like a scaffolding for the workplace, right? Then you've got social safety, which are things normally like, like uh, Vision Zero or Safety First or like Lang O'Rourke's um, Next Gear, like a saying or, a, or something like that that makes us feel like we're, we're, we're being safe as a company, right? Um, and then you've got demonstrated safety, which is what we spoke about, is being able to demonstrate to external stakeholders that we're being safe, insurers, subcontractors, uh, employing contractors, so on and so forth. So like RAMs or something like that would be a really good way of demonstrating safety. But also they're not, they're not like one thing. So a risk assessment could be, will be an aspect of physical safety, demonstrated safety, social safety, and admin safety. It's mostly admin safety, but it could be all four of them. And they're ultimately separated from the safety of work but all of those things are trying to influence the safety of work. So that's, I'm getting like a bit academic. Here. I apologize for that. But I think the main thing is the main thing is just understanding that you've got all these different types of work that you're doing. And ultimately you don't have control on work. You have influence on work. You don't control the worker unless they're a slave. Despite and what your risk assessment says. Despite Sorry? what your risk assessment says. Despite yeah. what your risk assessment you can, says. You can, write, you can write a risk assessment, right? And I can choose not to follow it. Mm-hmm. Right? But everything else, the culture, so social safety, the, 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 the risk assessment itself, the attitude, the relationship between me and you, the environment I'm in right now, that helps influence me to make the right or wrong decision. But it doesn't control me. Okay. So risk assessments, should they include influences as well as controls? Or yeah. should we... Should we not have risk assessments? Wow, no. Now, see, well, this is a... Sorry, I know I'm going a little off piece here. I've I've actually written down another question as well around the way we're talking about safety. It's almost like a different department to health. Oh, yeah, definitely. But uh, anyway, we'll we'll, we'll have a little explore of that as well. You know, so go go with the risk assessment. Should it include influences as well as controls? Those people that are listening who aren't safety people, by the way, maybe getting a little bit lost uh hopefully from a fleet point of view you do understand safety but risk assessment you've got your hazard and then you've got your controls essentially to control that hazard which then obviously manages the risk which is the risk assessment that's that's what we're talking about so from a historically controls would be the element ppe training you know hierarchy of control making sure that we're eliminating making sure that we're using um technical uh technical things to be able to help support the, the the control to be able to reduce the risk yeah influences then how how does that fit in or, or should that fit in or am i just pie in the sky no i think it's an interesting question ultimately what we're talking as can what i'm what i'm saying in in that or, or how i've interpreted interpreted david and drew's paper what i was just talking about a minute ago that they i believe that they would say all of those what we would call controls are not actually controls they're influences so we're not saying it's addition we're saying that's what they are we're trying to we call it control but ultimately it's kind of like a false sense of control like a false sense of safety and that they are influencing the the decision that that person makes because ultimately that's what we're all struggling with now we have had legislation from the health and safety at work act in 74 Right. And since then, we have killed less and less people every year other than the last decade. So last decade, we on on average have killed 140 something people a year every year. Not changed. Same for same problems, same areas. And nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. We've tried everything. And the thing that keeps coming back to. Kind of like the cause, so to speak, uh, in quotations, is. People just not doing the right thing. Oh, Bob wasn't following the procedure. Steve, Steve didn't read the risk assessment. Blah, blah. Bob's an idiot. It's always the same thing. The person didn't do what we wanted them to do, right? So, I don't know. In fleet, it might be using your mobile whilst, whilst driving, right? Mm-hmm. So, our reaction to that would be control. Remove the phone. 
right? That's the easiest way, right? Hierarchy of control, eliminate, right? You're not allowed your phone in a car, right? But we all have our phones in the car. So interestingly, I um I actually I actually read a piece of I was in I was reading Jill Kernick's book actually, and she talks about it in there. And I did a LinkedIn poll on this. I'm just get the uh, the picture up so I can read out the um the actual results. I asked the question. So based on the two statements I read in the book, you are four times or one statement. You are four times more likely to be involved in a collision when you're using your phone, um, when you're talking on the phone in the car, not using it, like so, not looking at it, just yeah, talking. on Bluetooth, on Bluetooth, yeah, on yeah. Bluetooth. Yeah, this um, comes back to another compliance and safe question. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're legally allowed to be on 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 your Bluetooth and your phone, right? But you are four times more likely to have a, con- a collision at that point. So is compliance safe? In this case, no. So I asked the question: How do my audience? So roughly, I'm connected to around three thousand ish, mostly safety professionals, right? And I asked the question: Basically, I have no calls and driving rule at work and personal at work, but not personal, e.g. like work car, personal car, personal car, but not work. Right. And I always take, I always take calls on our drive. Right. It was a straight up give or take 44% at work and personal. I don't take calls. So basically when I'm, um, when I'm driving, I don't take calls and 45%, I always take calls when I'm driving regardless work or car. So people are divided on this 100%. So what we might do is go, well, we're going to go down this control route and say, no, no phones, no phones in your car. That would be a real simple way to deal with it. And it wouldn't make sense, but then you've got a behavior issue. So now it's not, now it's not a control issue because you've, you've got the control. Now it's getting people to follow the rules. And when people don't follow the rules, it's because the rules don't work with real life. Real life is like, well, I'm on my way home now. My wife's ringing me or my wife's pregnant and I want to know if something's gone wrong. Or, you know, for example, we had actually a really good work example in my last last place of work when we had the guys would leave home and drive really long distances to go to do a job. And it was really common that that job would get cancelled halfway through their journey. So they would ring them up and say, turn around, come home or go to your next job. Right. So it was efficient for us as a company for him to be able to answer the phone whilst on it. So we kind of found a middle ground and we said, okay, you're allowed to answer your phone in a car, but we want to give you some control as the driver and you make a decision as to, is this phone call kind of cognitively challenging? Like, is it an in-depth conversation or is it really simple? So keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it simple is basically like how we, how we kind of run it. So like, would I have a conversation like this whilst driving a car? Not a chance, but actually I love having conversations like this in the car. If I'm, I'm like drive and I like to ring people when I'm driving, because I love talking, obviously, as we've picked up. And, um, <laughs> and so, so you get to a point where you're like, this is actually really hard to deal with. But what we're trying to do is influence because we can't control. You can't control. You could say, we're going to take your phone off it, but they can still break that rule. You know, you're not having your phone in the car. Okay, fine. I won't have my phone in the car, boss. The second you're gone, phone's in the car. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen it. I've worked at companies, had a no phone car rule, um, no phones in the car rule. And yet the sales department, whenever I rang them, always answered the phone, always answered the phone. Why? Because they had goal conflicts. They had KPIs that said, always answer the phone. We measure you on the phone calls that you, that you miss. And we judge you on that. So you've got these goal conflicts. So what we're trying to do is influence behaviors. So you're trying to work out where's the strongest influence. To bring it all the way back to your original question, should what like what about our risk assessment? So ultimately, I think that controls are not in fact controls. Some may be more controlling than others, but mostly they're influencers. And secondly, fundamentally we have a very big issue with how we do risk assessments they're not very good at all when most of the time we think about risk assessments so you kind of gave the example of hazard and stuff like that you're kind of you talking about the template of the document that's not a risk assessment the document is not a risk assessment the document is a formal what i would call compliance process of recording yep. that risk assessment but a risk assessment would be me and you chatting before we get on the truck saying how are we going to do this job 
you know, it's your driver. He's coming up to the the, the the bridge and he's just seen a sign that says high winds or whatever. He knows he's got a big load and he knows it it could topple or he knows he's got a heavy load and it's it's more sturdy or something like that. He's making that risk assessment. He or she is making that risk assessment as they drive. Driving is a great example. Do I go at this, this, this um, do I go at this roundabout or not? You know, what's that car doing there? You always know, you always know when you're driving, don't you? Like that guy's coming over or that guy's in the wrong lane or whatever. Cause you're risk assessing as you go all the time. Lorry drivers are some of the best at it. So we need to probably reframe what a risk assessment is in our brain as well. Um, but that's probably a different conversation as well. I love it. I love it. Okay. So Next question I had, I'm going off piste again because the next one should be what safety culture. So we'll come back around to that. Yep. Is safety profitable? Ooh, ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a blind side question. Is it profitable? <laughs> well, it's just something we were talking about before. And I, I still I still want us to explore is health another department because I can nail that one in my opinion. Okay, yeah. go for it. My opinion is that, that safety professionals are too generalist. If we are going to be health and safety i think one of them is going to be done bad because it's just too complicated and, and ultimately i think the whole profession needs to be reviewed i think we need risk generalists i think if we can have risk opera so my company is set up under we call ourselves operational risk consultants right so the long-term vision is we want to we want to cover not just safety we want to cover health we want to cover corporate social responsibility environment. And I'll have a team of generalists that have a real general low level information about that. And their job is to identify problems like your GP does. Mm -hmm. So your GP is not an expert on cancer. He's not an expert on, I don't know, gastro issues or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. His or her job is to identify and put together issues and go, right, referring you to a specialist. Mm -hmm. That's, in my opinion, what safety should be. What most safety professionals are are generalists, and they do do that, but they're specialising in one of those issues. So in my opinion, I'd like to see, let's imagine you're a massive company, right? And like Wing Canton, for example, right? Just to pick the fleet example. Um, are they fleet? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we can't know <laughs> briefly. Yeah. You were going to turn around and go, that uh, James said they're just no. warehouses. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. No, they're, they're fleet. They've got fleet. So, well, they, uh, last time I checked, they did. I might stand yeah. corrected, but they've got fleet. Yeah. So, so, for example, like a massive company like that, I would much prefer to see a, a team of kind of risk advisors that can identify risk to the company that could come from the operations. And health and safety is one of those. Quality is another one of those. Uh, environment is another one of those. And then they refer to specialists. Now, most health and safety people are kind of specialists in health and safety. But in my opinion, you can't be a specialist in health and safety. They are two very different things, in my opinion. And health is really complex. And so is safety. So in my opinion, I'd like to see the two split up. But we are where we are. And um, and that's it. So, yeah, I suppose that's, that's my opinion. Kind of brings us on to your next question. Is it profitable? I just want just one on sec, but let's go back on that. I just wanted to put my two pennies before on around health. Yeah, sorry. And mate. I think no, 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 and that's absolutely fine. I just think because it, it sort of links into the passion of mine around mental health and the fact that for yeah. so long health and safety has been around physical health. And yeah. actually, in reality, it's not because health is health, it's it's both, it's one and the same. Yeah, yeah. It's that you know, the, the two things are intrinsically linked. Little story for you. My uh, Maggie won't mind me mentioning my wife. She um my wife, sorry. That, that, that's how it just came out then. Uh, anyway, name's Maggie, my daughter's name is Maggie. I didn't know that. Great name, great name, Maggie. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, she worked at a secondary school okay. in her early thirties. The culture was challenging. To be yeah. fair, anyone who goes and looks at her profile will be able to see which one. So I've got to be a bit careful. But the culture was really challenging. She had horrific uh, autoimmune um, rheumatoid arthritis. Really, okay. really affected her stress related because as soon as she left and started working in the business and doing first aid training which she loves doing and yeah. she's really happy doing from a cultural point of view as well not the same challenges it all cleared up yeah. all cleared up so just we've just, just something for the lady time. that um we've just interviewed a lady that worked in um i think it was like rehabilitating um Ex criminals and stuff like that uh anyway and um she had like a really stressful job but she loved her job 
and she was really high performing. So she didn't, I think a lot of the time people think that the um when we talk about anxiety or depression that i'm just in cold up in a corner and i'm like i'm just crying all the time or stuff like that it's not, it's not like that at all right. like you can have like anxiety really bad and be a people pleaser and and just work and work and work right. and in kpi world that's a good worker but actually that person is full of anxiety right and she actually um was told by the doctor you can't have a baby. They were trying to have a baby for ages. Mm-hmm. You're just um, unfortunate. You as a couple can't have a baby. I'm sorry about that. So they went over to IVF. Amongst all of this, you can listen to the whole podcast. I think it's out. Um, uh, it's a conversation with Asha, Asha Burzon. And um, long story short, IVF, um, spent loads of money on it, stopped working, was signed off with stress, fell pregnant. Wow. And it was stress-related, 100%. Yeah. And since then, I've had another kid, and um, if one hundred percent stress related, so now she has um, specialised in hypnotherapy and works with companies proactively to deal with um, extreme cases of stress in the workplace. Mm. Um, and and ultimately, that comes back to your original point in that mental health one hundred percent it affects everything we do. You know, mm. biologically speaking, when we are stressed, our body puts all the blood in this places where we're ready to run away and stuff and fight Mm -hmm. right and that's a really bad thing for us to be in all of the time Mm -hmm. but i don't know enough about that for me to manage that in the workplace and i can't know enough about that and know enough about working at high and know enough about behaviors and know enough about cultures just too much Mm -hmm. in my opinion so i think that really really i think mental health is a great example and i know dr Coop, I, I apologize if you're wrong, but Dr. Cooper, if he's a professor, then I apologize. But uh, Dr. Dominic Cooper is really passionate about that stuff. Mm. Um, you follow him on LinkedIn, he will turn around and tell you that health and safety should not be dealing with welfare and mental health. He 100% thinks it's a specialist area and we should stay away and we're not competent to deal with it. Mm. I think I think health has always just been linked to safety because the idea is, is that if it's safe, it doesn't harm health. And 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 a little bit like the whole compliance and safe thing, it, the two things aren't linked no. necessarily. No. No. Anyway, safety and profitability. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, I kind of like touched on it earlier in the, the like if you zoom out as a company, mm. so if you if you zoom in on the task, then safety is not efficient, right? Because it's slow. We've got to focus. We might have to do things not the quickest way because it, it's it's unsafe to do it the quickest way or whatever. But then if you zoom out, it's, it's, it's inefficient for a company to be um, to be unsafe because you'll get enforcement, your premiums will be up and so on. Um, so in that context, it's a cost. I wouldn't say it increases profitability in that context. However, what I would say is that if you were to look at this more culturally um, and you were to try and create an environment at work which creates the right behaviors that you're looking for the best way to do that is to look after your employees and care about them and tell them you care about them go the extra mile for them do the christmas hamper shit you know look after them say thank you once in a mark once in a while ring them up and say do you know what pete i really appreciate what you did yesterday that's a cracking piece of work mate and i really appreciate like like eliminate those phrases like good is expected of you i remember being told that when i started in the working world like good is expected of you James, you know what I mean? And like this, this world that we live in, that everything comes off the employee line, like everything comes off the salaries. It's, it's the bottom line employees that get cut first. You know, we can't afford to give you a pay rise. Once you realize that your biggest asset in the, in your, in your, your company is the workforce and you look at them like an asset, like you do your lorries, your machines, your tools, whatever, and you look after all of that stuff. You've got an engineering department that looks after the machines, but you haven't got a department that looks after people and actually cares about them, not just be compliant and does what you're told, but actually cares about them, then 100% I think it's profitable because if you have empathy for a person, you put yourself in their shoes and you try to understand the challenges that they have. If you care for a person, if you know that person, you know that their their you know their wife's name, their husband's name, their children's names, whatever, 
you, you know them and you care about them, you have a relationship with them, trust me, they will work tenfold for you. Trust me. There's, there, there is research on it. The great book we've read at the book club um, at Project Malia and by, uh, Drive by Daniel H. Pink, you know, there's, there's so much research out there, scientific research that says people are not motivated by carrot and stick. They're not motivated by, you do this wrong, I'm going to hit you. You do that wrong, you do that right, I'm going to pay you more. They're not motivated by that. They're motivated by purpose. They're motivated by relationships. So for me, when when safety starts becoming the more cultural side of things, like where we like to specialize in, in, in that sort of behaviors and culture and how we influence behaviors and decision-making, it's all about building a culture and environment in which we care for those people. Then yeah, 100%, I think it becomes profit, profitable. Um, if that makes sense. No, I love that. Have you ever come across motivational maps? I don't think I have. Oh mate. Game changer. Absolute game changer. Maps. I, do, I do them with all of my uh, all, all of my team. So essentially motivational maps. If you if you Google it, um I, I guess it's kind of come from the whole disc profile type stuff, but discs around like preferences, right? Motivational maps about preferences, but it's about the preferences that motivate you most and make you do your best work. And the right. idea is, is there are there are three red motivators which are around financial building. Um, uh, they're you know like uh, oh, I can't remember what the other ones are. You've got blue. There's three blues. There's there's three reds, three blues, three greens. Greens are relationship motivators, so they'll be about teamwork or they'll be about uh, being a star, for example. Um, and then there's a, there's another one around, um, another relationship motivator. I can't remember them all off my head. Blue ones are much more around meaning and purpose and those kinds of things. And then there's also about being an expert, for example, that's another blue one. So you want to be the person that people go to because you know stuff, right? So the biggest compliment you could pay in uh, someone who's highly motivated by expert is, the best way you could compliment them is to go, I really value your opinion on this. Boom, motivation through the roof because yeah. that turns them on. But the most demotivating thing you could tell an expert is, I don't really value your opinion. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's literally like that's death. All of a sudden, literally, that person's going to leave tomorrow because they're so motivated by being an expert that that's mortally you know, offensive to them. And essentially, people are have all nine motivators, but in different levels. Yeah. The different mixtures so you've got like this magic mix so the idea is is if you know what motivates people best as a line manager and as a leader you're able to know what's going to really affect you can almost preempt the stuff that's going to offend them yeah. really offend them for example and the other stuff that's really going to motivate them because you give them more of that stuff yeah hi it's pete from flagship partners we're really proud to sponsor a half dozen things podcast at flagship partners we take road safety really seriously and we're your road safety partnership we help transport companies with compliance and training across their businesses, including first aid, driver CPC, and other transport management services. So if your fours are accredited or you want to improve your operator compliance risk score, give flagship partners a call today. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I think you touch on something really good. I did, I did want to actually just clarify one point, which I think is really important from Daniel Pink's work uh, in the book Drive. Whilst I say that money and is, is not a motivator, is money is not a motivator providing there is a fair base level salary. So I just wanted to, so that people don't misinterpret that. I say, hey, we're just not going to pay you anymore. Like, yeah. no, 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 that's not how it works. Like you have a fair salary. So he is really clear about that in the book. Have a mm -hmm. fair salary, fair remuneration. Um, and, and he doesn't say in line with legal compliance, he says fair which I think is a really interesting point as well. Um, but but to park that for one second, I think that's just really important. I, I didn't mention that. Secondly, to come back off what you just said, I think the, the, what you what you kind of talk about there, Pete, is something that I think is really, really important, is acknowledging that all the people in your organisation are all different. They're all motivated um, by different things. They're all ticked for different things and they all get annoyed by different things and they're weaker and stronger at different things and that's really good the problem is is that we've we've dealt with particularly safety for a long time and quality as well on a on a blanket approach kind of standardization standardization works really really well in products and services like premier in you know you know what you're going to get mcdonald's great standardization works for stuff like that right it doesn't work for people 
So the biggest thing, like if anyone's worked with me ever, they will always hear me go, oh, blanket rules don't work. Blanket rules don't or like I literally will scream it. I've been in a, I've been in meetings where I'm messaging a guy and I'm like capital letters. Do I have to fucking say it again? Blanket rules don't work. They don't work with people. You can have a blanket rule in an organization and it won't work because people have different perceptions of safe. We come back to what we were talking about. What is safe? People have different perceptions of risk. How many people do you know that have taken COVID really, really seriously? Probably what you might consider over the top. And how many people do you you use? know that have taken it so blase and they're just like whatever then how do you how many people do you know the way and the other scale that don't even think it's real right and you sit somewhere within that scale so covid has been such a good example of risk perceptions and how people deal with it in different ways mm-hmm. so blanket rules don't work and the disc profiles and things like that and that example of motivating motivational maps that you talked about there is a really good tool really good tool for us to go okay I'm going to do this safety project, for example, with this team. So I need to consider who I'm talking to here, right? Oh, we've got James, who is auditory and and a, and a visual learner and, and, a, and a kinetic learner. So that are the three ways that he learns. But the least way that James learns is by reading and writing. Right? He learns so much more by watching, talking, and doing. What do we do with all our risk assessments? Oh, they're all written. All right, so James is not going to learn fuck all of them from that risk assessment, is he? No. And safety is terrible for that. Everything mm-hmm. we're, everything is written down. Everything is written down. And I asked the HSE this question, would you have a problem if an if a organization communicated their risk assessments out via video? They said, nope, not a problem. Mm-hmm. As long as it's done. Mm-hmm. As long as you can evidence it's done as well when the inspector comes around. But ultimately, whatever happens. So it's not one or the other, it's all of the above. It's yeah. a bespoke approach to each person. And I think that is a big part. That comes back to this influence and control thing. As if you're doing something that works for them, they'll do it. Mm-hmm. They will do it 100%. I think the, the the value, we do so many like videos and induction videos and um, try and find different ways to engage with people so the message is, hits home is, uh, is is vitally important. It's funny, you mentioned about COVID being like this risk, how we process risk. I saw a really funny meme the other day around, we can never really use the saying, avoid it like the plague again. Because we've kind of, we've kind of had a plague now and realised that people will avoid it and some won't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Avoid it like a plague. Ooh, so what, don't avoid it? <laughs> it just, it's just kind of null and void now, isn't it? As, yeah, a, as, yeah. a, as a saying, full stop. Anyway, um, I'll tell you what we're like. We're not even halfway through the questions, right? Uh, I think I think we might need to do a part one and a part two, right? Um, so right. what is safety culture? What is safety culture? Uh, I put that in there because I, know I was going to call it culture, but I thought I think that what people might know more of is, or what people might think that we're going to talk about more is safety culture. So I thought I'll put that in and then I'll make a really bold statement at the front of it. And then we'll go into why, uh, mm-hmm. what is safety culture is the answer to that. In my opinion is it is non-existent. It is bullshit. It doesn't exist. It's a load of crap. Um, when we talk about safety culture, nine times out of 10, we're just talking about how people behave in relation to safety. Mm-hmm. It's nothing to do with culture. That's behavior. Behavior is influenced by culture 100%, but it's not safety culture. Mm-hmm. Consultants just say safety culture to make us feel good. And we could, we could charge you more because we're going to come in and do a, a culture assessment as bollocks, right? It, it doesn't exist. Culture kind of exists, but it just kind of is. It's like this weird thing. So in the academic industry, they call it a construct, right? Which is a really posh way of saying it's kind of like the air that you breathe. You can't feel it, you can't see it, you can't touch it. It just it just is. Yeah. yeah just not non-matter. It's just yeah. non-matter, something that's there. It's yeah. Just air, right? So if you if you imagine it like air, so in London, for example the air is shitter than in Nottinghamshire, for example, right? Because much more of a city in London, right? So we might do things to influence or improve the air quality in London, right? But ultimately, it's going to take a long time for our air quality to improve. Culture is exactly the same. So culture is, I really like Dave Snowden. Dave Snowden is, uh, I really like his, I really like Dave Snowden's description of culture. There we go. Get my words out. Um, so Dave Snowden is uh, an academic, does like natural science. So he talks about like complexity at work, 
but from like a naturalistic perspective. So he mm-hmm. makes comparisons to like nature and stuff, which is kind of cool. I, I kind of like it. Um, and we've had him on the podcast and if you don't get fucking mind blown, you can go on there. Cause I'm not really sure even now what we spoke about. I have no idea what he was saying. The whole time. Um, it's and, about like um, how I feel James. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Um, and um, yeah. So he says that culture is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably ruining this, but he says that basically it's culture is a result of interactions over time. So I'm going to guess you've read the book Atomic Habits. You look like an Atomic Habits kind of guy. I've written Atomic Habits, yeah. yeah. Essentially, you're, talk- you're talking about conditioning, right? People are conditioned over time by their interactions. Yeah, exactly. So in Atomic Habits, what well, um, it's James something, isn't it? Who wrote James it? Clear. James Clear. He says something I really love. Um, each, each action is a vote to your to the person you want to be, right? It's something like that. So if you think about it at work, each interaction that you have with a person is a vote towards the culture that you want to have. So if you're having a, if you have a conversation, that conversation is driven by performance or driven by, you know, hierarchy, right? You know, when you're saying things like, right, I'm going to pull rank here, Pete, right? I just need you to get this fucking done, mate. All right. Thanks. That is a vote towards a culture that is very hierarchical, that doesn't have psychological safety, that that tells you, you shut up until you get to a position of hierarchy and then you can say something, right? Or we get to a position where we go, "Ah, Pete, I've got this problem. What do you think? In my head, I've got a solution, what I think it is, but I'm just going to ask you, right? I'm not going to say that out loud. I'm just saying that for context, right? So in our interaction, it's, hi, Pete, what do you think about this problem? Now it's a vote towards a culture that is in promoting psychological safety. It's promoting you. It's telling you that your, your value, your, your opinion is valued. Right. So that's what culture is. It just is right. It, you can feel a culture when you get there. That's why everyone says, oh, I can turn up on site and I'll tell you what the culture is within seconds. They're not wrong. Like you can tell within seconds what the culture is like. I was at a site the other day. I was with the operations director. I was walking around site. Everyone was saying, hi, hi, Franz, oh, hi, you're right, Franz. I was like, oh, hi, Pete, how you doing? You're right, how's the wife? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. He knew everyone. He knew everyone by name. He knew them. He knew their family. That is a vote towards a culture where I care about you. And that means you'll, you'll care about me. So every time we get to a point of culture, it's, a, it's the interactions that we have is a vote towards the influence in the behaviors so when we talk about safety culture what we're talking about is how people behave when they're doing safety related stuff right well your interactions define that so you just got to keep having those conversations around safety and trying to define how do i influence safety using my admin systems using my interactions using my my design of the workspace you know and it's not as simple as saying we're going to put safety in number one of our, our agenda because if you put safety in the number one of your agenda, it's just a platitude. But if you put it at the number one of your agenda and have valuable conversations, then it's no longer a platitude and it's a vote towards a culture that you want to be. So you can put it at the top of your agenda. I've seen so many people do that. Put it at the top of your agenda. Okay, that's fine. How, what conversation do you have it? If you're just going any safety stuff, fucking roll tumbleweed. No. Okay, cool. Move on. Great. Now that's out of the way. You've just voted that safety is not important. Mm-hmm. But if you if you're going right, how do we how do we think about? I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example now. You would you would use a question like an open question to try and spark a conversation about it. So you're exploring. You know, when was the last time something went wrong at work, Pete? And then you'll be like, oh, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, oh, let me think. When did something go wrong? Oh, there was this, actually. I fucking went to Doris's house, and then this happened, and then that happened. And you get this big story, and then you can pick things out of that story and you say, all right. Some people go like, oh, we need to get more near-miss near miss reporting. We need more near-miss reporting. I need more near-misses. That's how I fucking hear that all the time. I'm like, why don't you just go into a room and just say, okay, how was your day? Yeah. I guarantee if you say, how was your day? You'll hear about more near misses than you will if you say, when's the last near miss? Particularly in driving. Like, so I've managed a small fleet of, of car, like car drivers, like people out doing, doing assessing work and stuff, right? And 
the, the, the manager was like, he was really good, really proactive guy. Um, still talk to him now, lovely guy. And um, we went through this lovely little journey with him, right? And he was like, I want to get more near misses, James. I said, cool, what's a near miss? And he was like, oh, um, what, for like driving? I was like, yeah. Um, and he's giving me examples. And I was like, I think they're more incidents. Like, did that sound like more incident? Would a near miss on a, on a motorway be like some dickhead just driving past me at 100 miles an hour? Nothing's happened, but that potentially was a really dangerous situation. That's a near miss. And he was like, well, yeah, but fuck me, I'd be doing reports every day if we did that. Yeah, I know. And that's why, as a team, you need to talk to the lads just about work. And then as a team, you'll pick out things that you go, okay, that's sounding nasty. Is there anything we can do about that? What does everyone think? Now it's a now it's a it's a vote towards them thinking about work and then thinking about is there anything we can do to improve, which ultimately is safety. That in a way that was a kind of a roundabout answer to to what it is, but I don't I don't think safety culture helps. When we say safety culture, it doesn't help. Let, let's just yeah. focus on what you're trying to talk about. If you're trying to, I'm trying to improve my reporting culture. You're just trying to get people to report more. If you want people to report more, make it easy. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, it's a little bit like cor- corporate bullshit speak, right? Like, uh, I'm just going to stick integrity up on the wall as one of our values. Yeah. The fact, the fact by sticking integrity on the wall and it just being yeah. there, it's going to make us have integrity. I've got a soapbox under here for talking about <laughs> value. On walls, so I get, I get out every now and then. it's ready to go. Oh, okay. I fucking hate that shit. I'm just my head. I've got care on here because I care about everybody. <laughs> All right, do you? Yeah, I care about everybody other than Bob. Bob's a prick. He's we just fired Bob. I, I, I let's roll David Brent out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I interviewed a guy um on the podcast a long time interviewed. That sounds a bit formal. I had a I had a chat with a guy on a podcast, he had two parts about building a consultancy, and he said one of his values as a company is um we don't work with dickheads. And he said, oh, and I stand by it. So when we had, when we brought our office, I, I said, the first thing I did is I paint it on the wall, he said. So I was like, okay, cool. So you paint it on the wall. And then one day, one of his consultants come in and he said, look, I'm having a right nightmare with this guy again. You know, we've had this time, time and time again. But yesterday I drove like 100 miles and he just didn't, turn, well, probably wasn't 100 miles, but I drove X amount of miles and he didn't turn up. And I rang him, I rang him, I rang him. He wasn't there. He said, I've had a fucking enough of this. This guy is a dickhead. And the owner was like, I said, it's a lot of money, mate. It's a lot of money. Like, we can't just pay off a client. And the consultant just went, I'm pointed. I just pointed at the wall and went, I thought we didn't work with dickheads, boss. I'll see you in a bit. I just walked off. And he went, fair enough. And this is a bit of like, he emailed the client and he just said, I'm sorry, we've had conversations about sorting this time and time again. I said, you're treating my consultants like shit. We don't work with people like that. Please consider this the last time we'll have engagement with you until you decide how to, you know, change how you behave and treat my employees. Now that's a bold fucking move. And it depends where you are as a as a company. You might not be in the position to do that as a company, right? Because like I'm I've literally just started my company. I'll tell you what my values are: paying the fucking mortgage and eating some food, right? So my values right now are, are those. So they're my temporary priorities. Right. There are things I value and there are my non-negotiables. Like I, if somebody rang me up and said, James, I get four grand. All I want you to do is just write your name on this piece of paper. Don't come and look at my, I wouldn't do it even for four. Yeah. Grand. No, right. No. But that's having integrity. Yeah. There's, there's things like that. you've got your integrity, you've got your non-negotiables, right. Mm-hmm. And you stick to them, but ultimately you can have values and they can change, man. But like, mm-hmm. don't just fucking put them on the wall and bullshit your way through life. Yeah. Like, yeah, we care. If you put it on the wall, if you put it on your lanyards, you put it on your mugs, you put it on your mouse mats, your USBs, your fucking desktop backgrounds, whatever you do, just to your point, have integrity, follow it, or take it off the wall. Like yeah, I much prefer a company yeah. turn around and say, do you know what? We value profit. That's mm-hmm. what we exist for. Cool, because there are people that would love that, that just want to work for a company that values profit. Yeah, And they're the people that you want. I don't want to work for you, but ultimately mm-hmm. there are people out there that do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think I think you're you're absolutely right. One of the things, one of the things we do is um, we do we we try and bring our values into the team into the team meetings, and we do like nom- we nominate each other when we've lived the values. I find that works okay. really well. Yeah. It's just it brings it to life, doesn't it? You know. Anyway, and there are, there are sorry. Well, no, I, go for it. I go on. What the next question is going to be, but 
having clear purpose, values, and principles, um, they are really, if you live them, if you live them as an organization, they're really powerful in, in improving risk management, improving behaviors in the workplace, because people can make decisions easier if they know what the company's principles are. It's like, what's our purpose? What's our purpose? We exist to do this. Okay, I'm struggling to decide whether we go with this contractor or this contractor. Well, which one can help us achieve our purpose? Or which one aligns with our principles? You'll, you'll influence that culture that you want to see with those. So one of the first things we would do with a customer if they said, hey, come in and, and look at our, give us a big culture change program. I'll say, right, where's, what do you exist for as a company? And the CEO will tell me this straight away. And I go to the machine operator. What do you exist for as a company, mate? And they would just be like, I don't know. We fucking, I don't, we make plastic boxes, you know, that's pretty, I don't know, plastic boxes for food. Like, but the, the CEO will be like, uh, we exist to create top of the range plastic boxes. And, it, and they're two different things, but that's really powerful. If you get that nailed down, really mm. powerful simon cynic talks about this like, i don't think his book was very good if i'm honest but his keynote was great um so like start Love with why is his book but his stuff uh, the golden circle is great. that's one of the first things we would do please excuse me shani's like literally just coming she wanted to be on the podcast and so she's just coming and made a load of noise haven't you shani that's all right shani can make a cup of tea if she wants she's, to. she's looking at me she's looking at me really embarrassed now you know you're on the podcast don't you and it's not going to be edited out. <laughs> it's not going to be edited out, just so you know. Do you want to you come might as well wave? come on screen now, Sean. You might as well come and wave now. Yeah, come she, on. Yeah, we're actually recording. Come on. Come, come on, Shani. Come on, you've gatecrash now. Yeah, You're, you're going to be all over YouTube. There, Hello. <laughs> this is James. Nice to meet you, James. And likewise. Oh, likewise. Crash, you can't yeah. hear him. There's no yeah, crash. Sorry, yeah. He's saying likewise. All right. Anyway. He's saying, God, next right. time, um, shut up. <laughs> here's, here's me Here's me living the values. You have a lovely weekend. You too. Thank you for all your hard work this week. I really appreciate it. Guys. See you later. He didn't say that to her when we weren't recording. That's that's bollocks. She walked in when we weren't recording, and he was like, "Shut the off with you! Don't say you're incompetent. <laughs> Do as you're told. You're staying late today." <laughs> Uh, mate. Anyway, how do we improve employee behaviours as if on cue? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that is what I, I, when I said, oh, I want to just quickly mention about the, the F, what I would call an ethical framework or cultural preferences, that's probably the first thing. If someone said I was struggling with behaviours, I would say, what do you exist for? What's your purpose? What are your principles? The, what defines you as an organization and how you behave? So like whether it is we have integrity or we we are trusting or whatever it is, did you pluck them out of the corporate buzzword library or do they actually mean something to you? Mm -hmm. um, and is that lived throughout your organization? That stuff is really powerful. It helps people make decisions and it helps them, it, it helps them go, okay, what I'm about to do if I consciously am mindful of what I'm about to do, is this in line with the values? Because ultimately, if you imagine like a, a culture of an organization, which is what behave, influences behaviors massively, is a collection of cultures. You have your own culture from your own background, from your own environment, your own family, and Shani will have a different one, and I will have a different one, and it will be based on our, where we're born and raised, our exposure to things. We all have our own little culture, and then we come into our workplace, and that workplace has its own little culture, and that influences behaviours. Behaviours are defined by the environment that they are in. So many of us say in the kind of hot world or whatever, human factors, there, there is context to behavior. Behavior exists within context. So when we will maybe have conversations, sometimes you might hear some people say, oh, we've got a no blame culture. Again, it's just a kind of another platitude. But what they're trying to say is that ultimately there's always something you can learn from behavior. So how do you influence behavior? Find the behaviors you like and find the behaviors you don't like. And don't demonize that person and be like, Pete, you douche why did you do that let's name shame let's get pete's name let's show everybody pete did this stupid thing and now we want to tell everybody and we're going to call it lessons learned so we feel better but ultimately what we're doing is no different from that woman in game of thrones just walking around going shame ding dong shame it's the same thing blame blame, blame shame, repeat <laughs> yeah blame shame retrain that's what we've done so long it doesn't work right um but if we go to Pete and we say, Pete, 
why did you make that decision? What what did you think was the, you know, what was going through your head? What was the influence in your moment? Why do you think that was the right decision to make? I'm not saying it was the right decision or wrong decision. What I'm saying is why do you why did you make that decision? And um, tell me, tell me what work was like in that moment. And you might say, I was fucking hot, or I had a, I wasn't concentrated, I was dehydrated, or blah, blah, blah. And I was a bit dizzy, but I knew I wanted to get this done. So I just pressed that button, but it was a wrong button. I'm really sorry. Right. Okay. Right. Now we can go, why was he hot and dehydrated? It's a fucking middle of winter. What's going on? Fuck me. Our aircon's broken. It's through the roof. And everyone's been bitching and moaning about heating on well. Right. Why is he not drinking much? Maybe we get everyone in little bottles. For everyone to make it easy for them to drink. I don't know. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. But ultimately, yeah. there is there is always context to behaviors that we can learn from. So find the behaviors that you like and learn from them. And find the behind and find the behaviors that you don't like and learn from them as well. Slapping people's wrists, firing them doesn't work. Sometimes you need to fire someone, whatever. Yeah. Sometimes people make behavior, people make behaviors. Sometimes people do behaviors that are just inexcusable and they're just proper dickheads right and people like that do exist but they're in the minority like research shows that there's less than one percent of people actually purposely do the wrong thing nine times out of ten is because of a reason yeah and there's so much to that so find the behaviors that you like and and try and amplify that and find the behaviors that you don't like and try and learn from that you know and then as you go if you if you do that from a position of having empathy so one of the values of of the framework that we've got um, that we use with our customers to try and help them um, is looking at organizational empathy. So does the shop floor have empathy for the decision makers in the organization? Do they understand the challenges of being in the finance department and dealing with all these big figures and so on and the pressure that they're under? And do the finance have empathy for the shop floor and how their decisions impact the shop floor? Do they have empathy for the fact that it's sweaty as hell down there in the machines so have empathy for the fact that they worked all through covid but everyone else was furloughed do the workforce have empathy for the fact that it was really horrible for some people to be furloughed right so for me empathy is really powerful i made a little tiktok video about it the other day but empathy gary v is a businessman right one of the most successful businessmen in the world and a massive influencer right he talks about empathy Every fucking day. If I say as a safety person, there was like, oh, there's some far left hippy dippy safety guy. Gary V says it, and everyone's like, yeah, Gary, Gary, because it it works. Have I'm empathy. Fan of Gary v. I'm, I'm a massive fan, fan of him. Every a lot of the stuff he says has heavily influenced the work that we do now with our customers to try and help them improve their cultures mm-hmm. and influence behaviors. Because ultimately, you can influence behaviors massively if you just care about people and have empathy for them guys even got a wine line called empathy wine for god's sake i'm gonna make a recommendation actually you've recommended a few books 12 and a half he's just released great book oh, okay great i've actually book. not read any of his books i've just have you lived, not no i've just lived on his podcast for about really? seven years <laughs> 12, yeah 12, 12 12 and a half is a really good book he's just released it i think i think you'd really enjoy it james actually okay. really enjoy it um empathy is one of the 12 it's basically the 12 and a half skills that he nurtures and lives by the half is what he calls kind candor and it's because he thinks it's a half skill because he's not very good at it and he has to work really hard at kind candor but the rest of it he talks about empathy accountability he's really really big on accountability and as a leader and and that i think that's the point that i wanted to make off the back of what we're talking about with influencing and improving behaviors is and actually it takes me back to a mutual friend that i that we know and that's Teresa swinton when i first heard her speak she said this thing and it stayed with me i've only ever heard her say it and that's as a leader you have to be aware of the shadow you cast yeah and i can't remember the exact context she used it in but how, how I always think about it is when you talk about behavior and we talk about influence and things, it's like safety first being a platitude, unless you're actually living that, unless you're demonstrating what's important to you as a leader to people all the time, you're never going to influence them about that stuff. So if you say safety first, and like you say, everyone just goes quiet at the meeting and you just crack on and you've got no questions about it, but then you drill into the finance person about the profit you are indirectly casting a shadow and telling everyone profit matters to you. Turnover matters. Safety doesn't. No matter where you put it on the list of stuff, 
But actually, if you go around the team and you start talking about safety and what's happening and what's going on today and having those conversations and spending your time there, all of a sudden it influences what's happening because of the shadow you're casting. You're telling people that's what matters. And that comes back to the original thing of like uh, culture is a result of interactions over time. So that interaction is a vote towards what you want it to be or what you subconsciously are making it anyway. You might want safety to be your first priority. If I'm honest, if I'm honest, I, I don't think safety could ever be first. If I'm honest, I don't think it should be first. I'm not even sure putting things in a hierarchy like that is really helpful, in my opinion, because one day, if I'm if I'm transfer, if I'm the accountant and I'm trying I'm transferring a million pound deal right safety 100 should not be your first priority no. right because i need that one million dollars <laughs> pounds right safety i don't give a shit about safety in this moment but if you are working on top of a freaking you know roof of a 20-story building no edge protection 100 safety is your first priority it's dynamic like it's it, it changes and ebbs and flows through work sometimes quality is the most important sometimes safety is most sometimes it's both sometimes it's all free it, you know and we, we carry on throughout the day having all them but we can have things that we as a company value and we might value the safety of our people and that's slightly different and then you can your interactions can be guided by that so a real simple example is i've had conversations with a customer where they've sent an email out and they said right we're going to do this manual handling training and um it's really important that we do this to be compliant um and it's mandatory so i want to make sure everybody turns up on this manual handling training okay that's probably an email that many of us have sent before um i i probably sent an email like that before as well now let's analyze that a little bit because that's an interaction. That email is an interaction and that's a vote towards the culture you want to do. And I think it's very important to remember the saying, words create worlds. Right? The words we use create the worlds we live in. I think it's so powerful. Adam Johns first said that to me and I was like, dude, that is epic. In that, yeah, I need to get like a bomb sound on my phone. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, but anyway... <laughs> I'll just, just dropping be, bombs, James. That's just yeah. all you do. Drop bombs. I'll just be pressing it all the time. I have got some sound effects on here. I've got a drum sound effect, a joke one. Anyway. Um, hold on. Hold, hold your horses. Hold on. Oh, yeah, keep, talk, keep, talking. Talking. keep talking. I'll be back in a second. Um, I feel uncomfortable talking to myself. Uh, so what was, <laughs> I can't remember what I was saying now. Yeah. So a real good example of that email. And then we take that email and let's analyze it a little bit. So we've got. Hi everyone. It's really important that you do this 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 training because um, we need it to be compliant, right? So that's the first thing. What you're telling me now is that your main driver is compliance, not safety. So subconsciously, that also tells me that it depends how far you want to take it, but that also tells me that if that legislation didn't exist, would you be doing this? I'm not sure maybe you would. So does that mean then that you're only doing this because the legislation uh, exists and therefore you don't care about me? Right. Then we carry it on and it says, and it's mandatory that you're there. Right. You're not ordering me to go. And ever since school, none of us like being fucking told what we do. We, we leave school and we go, I'm never going to be told what I'm doing, what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm a free person. I'm an adult. I make my own decisions. And then we go to work and get told what to do all the fucking time. Right. So in that email, we've just said, we don't care about you. I'm going to force you to go and you don't have any choice. People don't like that. And that's a terrible way for us to influence people. But also that's a vote towards a culture we want, which is a vote towards hierarchical. Um, the MD has just told me you must go and I must now go. Right. And a vote towards compliance is our first thing. So you might be saying safety first and you might think it's safety first because you're doing the training. And this is where leaders get confused sometimes. And this is where workforce get confused about leaders because they think they don't care about me. They do, they're just not very good at communicating it because that they think that compliance is safe. They, they are doing this to protect you, but they don't realize what it's like because there's just so much going on. And, and Dave Soden says as well, if you don't understand the, the challenge of leadership, then you don't understand what it is to be a leader. Um, and I think that's really powerful as well. And that's why in our framework for uh, our risk fluent framework, it's, it's called organizational empathy because we need to have empathy for leaders as well as the shop floor. 
Uh, I went down a rabbit hole there, but yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. And I, I went looking for my bullshit button and I couldn't find it. Oh, I used to have one of them in the office. I We've used got to an amazing bullshit button. button. And it does bullshit in a different voice each time you press it. It's yeah. amazing. Great for training. People the one that um the one that they used to have, used to have like some cowboy being like, yeah, yeah, with some bullshit there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Right then, I've got two more questions. Are you okay for time? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Listeners, are you okay for time? Yeah, we're good for time. Everyone's I'm good. Listening. I feel like okay. I should have a glass of wine now. It's six minutes past five on a, on a Friday. I know, right? We survived it, right? Uh, two questions. One you don't, you're not expecting. First one, let's hit the one you're expecting. So what's resilience? Yeah, right. Resilience is something we're talking about a lot now. And I put this in there because I have got something to say. <laughs> but but ultimately I think it's I think it's really important because resilience is where we, we all seem to want to go right now, right? And I get that. I really get that because we've just gone through a period of 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 really difficult time. We've gone through change. We've gone through we've gone through a fucking pandemic, man. You know, and that's something that many many of us would have never even dreamt of going. It's a, for some, it's been the hardest thing we've ever gone through since the war. And it's economically, it's the hardest thing we've ever gone through uh, since the war. And even socially, it's the hardest thing we've gone through since the war. Um, and many of us, including me, have never even seen the war or even had any connection to it. So we now got this massive driver towards being more resilient. And I mean, from a company perspective, not a mental health perspective, right? So a resilient company. What is resilience? A resilient, uh, a resilient company is a company that can deal with change and, and kind of emerging situations. So they could, do, they could have dealt with this pandemic quite well. So how do they do that? Many would say that they've got the capacity to deal with change. So in resilience community, call it the adaptive capacity, right? This is another fancy way of saying we've, we've built up a lot of slack in our organization to be able to, to kind of dodge stuff and deal with stuff. But fucking great example of that or a great example of not having resilience would be the NHS right now. So mid NH mid uh, pandemic, they had a massive shortage of, of PPE because we weren't resilient. We didn't have a stock. They didn't have a stock, right? So they weren't resilient from that point of view. They've never been resilient for a number of beds, right? They've never been resilient for staff for a long time. So they're not resilient. Why are they not resilient? And this is a, the important point that I wanted to get to. Um, they're not resilient because they're trying to be efficient. Now, I think it's really important to understand that there is a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. So you can be an, a lean, efficient company, which is kind of like a just-in-time, just-enough model, right, which many of us have operated off for a very long time. Lean Six Sigma, really popular. And to be honest, if you did Lean Six Sigma properly like it was originally intended, it closely relates to a lot of resilience principles, but ultimately um, how lean has kind of been sold over the years is very much like just enough, just in time, right? And to a business that's really attractive because we don't want to have loads of PPE sitting around. We don't want to have loads of RPE sitting around that that runs out of date and we have to train people on and we've got to replace every, every year or so, costs loads of money and it's sitting there doing nothing. Why is that sitting there? Sitting there for a pandemic. When was the last time we had a fucking pandemic, James? Stop being health and safety gone mad, yeah? Oh, shit, here's a pandemic. So there's a trade-off between being a resilient organization with loads of capacity, like extra staff, extra beds, extra lorries, extra products, whatever, right? Like that savings account, is that your buffer, right? So that's you as a resilient person. And then an efficient person is like, you know, hand to mouth. You know, we've got just enough and that's good because as a company, we want that. And I think the really, really important point, once you realize there's a trade-off, you need to understand that it's not one or the other, it's both. And you need to work out in your organization, where do you need to be resilient and where do you need to be lean? They're, they're, they're two different. It's not one or the other. Standardized lean is a bad fucking idea, but standardized resilience is a bad fucking idea as well. But you'll get resilience co consultants will be like, let's be resilient. Everyone's got to be resilient. No, 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 be resilient. Be a resilient company. It means having loads of this and loads of that, loads of this. That's not, that's not fucking efficient. Now we're all just going to go bankrupt. So it's, it's not one or the other. It's both. So standardized anything, in my opinion, is, is a bad idea. Even standardized standardization is a bad idea. 
but you got resilience and efficiency. So you as a company essentially need to make a risk-based decision is if this went wrong, how bad will it be? And if you all go fucking bad, then that's a place to build resilience. If this went wrong, how bad would it be? Yeah, not that bad. We'd be right. That's where we're hitting with efficiency. And we're going to be lean there and we're going to go fast and we go quick and we go just enough, just in time. All right. So there's, there's like a balance. You, you, people do it all the time in like sales. So it's a mass, massive customer, um, but we pissed him off loads and loads and loads. And he's just not happy. Right. We're going to build resilience with that customer because we're going to be like, right, let's not fuck up. Let's take extra product. Let's have extra time. Let's make sure we get this done. Right. But we've got, I don't know, let's say we're under loads of pressure. Well, loads of companies under pressure at the moment because of like gas rates and heating rates and product raw material rates are going up through the roof, right? And your raw materials for many of our, many of like my customers, raw material prices are going through the roof, right? So they're trying to get stuff done as quick as quick as possible. So they're on a lean process. They're like, get the fuck out the door as quick as possible. You even tell them we need to build some resilience and have some extra capacity in case something goes on. They're like, shut the fuck up, James. Right? If I don't sell this product right now it's going to i'm going to lose money so it's a it's a balance between one or the other and i think that's really important to understand and i wanted to mention it because i was, I was thinking like if people listen to your podcast and maybe they listen to what we're talking about and i talk about resilience a lot they might go away and start reading loads about resilience and be like yeah this is fucking awesome i want to be resilient and then go oh now we're not very efficient it's, it's, it's a balance and i think that's really important to understand Love that. Love that. Okay. No, then I, I totally agree. Last question then. Yeah. Do we need to rebrand safety? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we should always re, we should always be challenging what what something is all the time. Like, so somebody asked me uh, a, a long time ago, like, what happens when we've rebranded it, James? So when we start fucking rebranding it again, then. Because that's the point of it. Like, so I'm writing this framework now for and this 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 uh, white paper. So everything I spoke about the risk fluent framework and all of those principles, we're, we're gonna put that on a white paper free of charge. Anyone can download. Well, either free of charge or, or extremely cheap, like under a fiver. Depends how much it cost me to have it on the website and shit. All right, but like ultimately, dirt cheap or or free. And I've lost my point. What was it talking about? Yeah, and and I've wrote in that white paper, if this framework is the same in like five to 10 years, it's failed. So like things should constantly be changed. We're not comfortable with that. We are so not comfortable. And safety has been building for such a long time on, on one thing, certainty. We have been trying to provide certainty to a company for fucking years, right? If we do this, are we safe? Yeah, we're safe. Yeah. If we do this, we're going to end up in court. No, no, I am certain. And because as companies, we're really uncomfortable in dealing with uncertainty. And that's where the resilience stuff comes in. You're more comfortable with uncertainty because you've built capacity. Right. But ultimately, safety is about certainty and work is full of uncertainty. Right. So we I think to answer your question, do we need to rebrand safety? I think, yes, people still have a perception of it. I'm still uncomfortable being described as a health and safety professional. It still makes me cringe a little bit. Um, I called my company a risk operational risk company. It's not a safety com company. But ultimately, I think that we need to be absorbed into a wider profession of risk. Um, I think that's where we belong. And I think we're a specialism with under the banner of risk. Um, and, and I think that, would position us where we need to be at the moment we're trying to be fucking everyone's friend and and all of a sudden we're no one's fucking friend and yeah. so we just ultimately as well we need to rebound people's perceptions which is why which is why we started the the podcast and the youtube channel was to and which is why like i wear very relaxed clothing and stuff like that is to tell you that we're not all pale stale and boring like i'm wearing shirt and tie and and, you know, being all prim and proper, I am the opposite of prim and proper. Um, you know, I am working class as they come and have been working my entire life to get away from that. But ultimately, I love being just proper, common as muck. And 
in safety, we are so not common as much. Like people don't like it. We're so uptight. So there's a brand to be, and maybe a lot of safety professionals will listen to that and be like, fuck off, James. No, we're not. But ultimately, <laughs> many of us have given this perception that we're the, like this crazy people that are really uptight, really smart. We don't want to take any risks. And we, we're here to just restrict your operations. But when you talk to most modern safety professionals, at least, and even the and even the more traditional ones, they're not like that at all, man. The most safety professionals are out, you know, doing some dangerous shit. Like the most safety pros I know have really nasty hobbies. Like they love hitting things or getting hit by things or jumping off things or diving in things where they shouldn't be, you know, because they've become good at one thing. It's really understanding what the risk is and how we're managing it. Um, so we need to change people's perception. I think a good part of that is that compliance conversation we had is understanding there are two different things, compliance and safety. Um, I think that will help us. But ultimately, we also need to restructure as well as rebrand. So in answer to your question, there's a lot of work to do. And yes, we do need to rebrand safety. Love that. Just love that. Just disrupting it, get keeping it changed. One one last thing. I know that I'd written down a final thing that I was going to ask you. I know, okay. I know. Uh, Post nominal. So, oh those that, those that are listening. Oh, here we go. This is my other soapbox. Hang on. <laughs> okay, no. So I've. Uh, I think we had a, mili- a been... millennium call. We just spoke about this okay. on the millennium. Well, I, and that's what triggered it. I, I saw a little comment on LinkedIn just before we came on the call. Oh, and, okay. Uh, I just I was interested. Strict, strictly speaking, just before James and I come on the call to the listeners, I've literally just been. Uh, granted chartered status by the Institute of uh, Logistics and Transport. So I'm feeling dead. Congratulations. Chartered. Say again, sorry? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I've got a nice C. Um, some of my friends call it, um, <laughs> so I've got a few friends who are similar to you, for example, James, but in the fleet sector, and they go, oh, such and such has got their clip because it's called C <laughs> milk and they call it, got their clip. Oh, um, I, love I love that. <laughs> the same guys that call me a clipboard wanker um, <laughs> <laughs> but um obviously just just got the distinction on that final assignment for ncrq as well so i'm about to be able to get grad iosh as well so i've been thinking for a little while i'm gonna look like the bomb like grad iosh c mill and then like chartered iosh i'm gonna be the man right and then and then all of a sudden I'm hearing some banter about post nominals and I'm thinking I've, I've seen a lot of people who I respect in the fleet sector, like fellows of the chartered Institute, they're dropping their post nominals. And I'm just, I'm interested in what you think, man. And I'm not going to be offended. Like, uh, this is part of it. Right. Just, just tell yeah, me what you think. Someone might. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. If you get um, offended, don't listen people. Yeah. I was, look, they, they have a job. Um, and I, and I think, that job is to make it easier for me to determine that you're at a certain level of qualification, in my opinion. And some might say competence. So sometimes there uh, you have an interview. So like to become chartered, normally it's like an interview process, you're like a peer-related interview, and then you get chartered, right? So it's a it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut to indicate comp- competency, right? So they have a job and I understand that job and I get it. What my problem is, is the amount of weight and value that we put on those post nominals for so long, like a certain body within the safety professional um, arena that, that does post nominals in the professional body, they just put out an article like why post nominals are so important. And in my opinion, it's just fucking dross. Like it was like, we just show, it shows commitment. No, no, it fucking doesn't. If you're leaving the military, right? Typically, if you're leaving the military, you get um, like a, a, a nice bit of money to be able to retrain when you leave the military, um, or most people do anyway that I've spoke to. And you could but go from you could go from never working in safety in your fucking life to being grad, and then potentially chartered in an extremely short amount of time. Extremely short amount. It has no indication on whether they are the same level, for example, as me, that's been doing this for 10, 11 years. But additionally, it doesn't take into account their history of what I would call real risk management in the fucking military. Like, it doesn't take that into account. It doesn't show that. So I just, I think they they have a value, but it's a very small value, and we have overvalued it, in my opinion, in that 
that we've become addicted to badges. We've become addicted to um, to all of these things that indicate a level of compliance. But ultimately, it's because the world is so busy. We've become a bit lazy, and that I actually don't want to really get to know you, Pete, and find out are you as good as what what you say you are. And I can only know that by employing you and watching you work for six months to a year to two years to three years. Those post nominals, they mean shit when it comes to that. You could have post nominals and be shit and you could have post nominals and be good. Um, so they have a job, but I think it's kind of similar to the safety and compliance thing. They have a job, they, they have a value, but remember they are not an automatic precursor of competency. Right. It doesn't, it, it isn't that it shows something. It shows that you've done something, but it doesn't show attitude. It doesn't show passion. It doesn't show it might indicate towards that, but it's not an automatic precursor. So I, I don't like that about them. And then the final thing I don't like about them is that they're too restricted in my opinion. So I am probably biased in my opinion of post nominals because I'd been working in safety for God, years. And I was at a position in my career, I was doing a podcast. Everyone was telling me like, oh, you must be getting like, so, you know, ask for this job and go get that job. You must be getting like loads of job offers. Well, I love what you're doing. And I was like, oh, fucking, I'm, I'm actually pretty good at what I do. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And it was my post nominals because I didn't have a degree level education. So I couldn't get grad. Um, wasn't possible for me. I'm not a academic person. I've mm -hmm. I've kind of forced myself to be over the last couple of years because I had to get a degree. I had to get a degree level education. I could or else I couldn't be grad. I don't agree with that because there are engineers out there that are engineers, right? And they just they've come up on the tools. I don't do fucking degrees. I don't do anything. But they're a hell of a lot fucking smarter than I ever will be. And and I'm going to send them on what nineteen month. 19 month NCRQ and then, and then, oh, now you can be a grad. Now you can be a grad. Like, I don't like how restrictive it is, but I'm not a massive fan of real strict hierarchies anyway. So there's a bit of a bias there as well, but I went through a period of, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get interviews. I couldn't get anything because they were like, oh, we want grad IOSH. And I was like, hang on a minute. I'm looking at this job description and that's the only thing I don't have. Like you said, ID, like all of the desirables in there, I was smashing them out of the park. It was like, oh, desirable experience in, in fire, fire risk assessment. I'm, like, I'm fucking fire risk hospitals, but yet you're saying I'm not good enough for this job. You're sort of desirable there. I've smashed it. Desirable experience trainer. I've been an accredited trainer three times over. Like I've trained people on terrorism, terrorism awareness, and, and I'm not good enough for this fucking job. Yeah, because you haven't got grad IOSH. And I'm just like, what a fucking joke. I got my degree, I passed my degree, I've fucking got grad IOSH and fucking in come the interviews. I was getting interviews left, right and centre and I spat my dummy out, mate. Like I didn't, I didn't want half of them. I was like, no, you didn't want me before, you're not having me now. Um, I didn't go to them. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I think that, I think it, it depends how you look at it and it depends how you approach it, but I think it, it makes people be like, oh, I'm just tech. I'm just tech. But like, you met Perry at Project Malik and probably once or twice. I've never met a person with, with passion like him. I've never met a person with passion like him. And I would rather employ Perry than I would anyone else that's got grad chartered or anything. Why? Because he's got fucking attitude, good attitude, and he's got passion to do what he does. And he's got drive. And I can see that. I don't need his post nominals to tell me that. I can get, I, I can know the person. But that doesn't devalue what they exist for. They, they bring a value. Um, it's more just how we use them, I think, is the problem, in my opinion. Makes total sense, mate. Makes total sense. So please don't, yeah, don't, uh, don't get rid of your post nominals if you don't want to get rid of them. I don't <laughs> demonstrate mine. Um, I have them on my CV. Um, if people want to see it, then they're there. But ultimately, I do have them. So I, I've registered with RSM now. I'm not, I'm not a member of IOSH anymore. Long story. Um, for another day but so i'm a member of double rsm now and i'm there primarily because of that exact reason my customers like the badge all customers like the badge because they've got to demonstrate compliance somewhere so i can say we've done our due diligence by getting somebody that is a a full member of double of rsm um which i think is grad level or whatever 
full level of, of double RSM. He's got this badge, got that badge. They're badges. They do a job. It makes it easier for us to do procurement and tendering. And that's good. We don't want to spend all fucking day doing that shit, do we? Uh-huh. So it's good. And it's the same as like in construction trades, you have like Chaz and SMAS and Safe Contractor and things like that. They're exactly the same. Same thing. Yeah. Just a, they're just a shortcut to demonstrating a certain level of, of compliance. It's not an automatic comp- com, uh, automatic precursor for safety. The same as post nominals. And and qualifications are not an automatic pre precursor for competence, in my Spot opinion. On, mate. Spot on. James, you've been a superstar, mate. We've been on here like an hour and a half, which is yeah. amazing. More than an hour and a half, hour and 45. This is officially the longest podcast I've ever done. Is it? Oh no. Uh, seriously. Longest sure podcast I've ever done. No, 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 it's cool. Cause I'm gonna chop it. I think I'm gonna chop it into two podcasts, man. But I think it, I think it's been absolutely brilliant, really insightful. And I think the listeners will absolutely love it as well. So Thank you very much for coming well, along. Thank you for having me. And I hope I hope people listening have got a lot of value from it. James is an absolute star. Uh, I think he's really clear on the way he thinks about stuff. And I just love how true he stays to his word. So, uh, yeah, really, really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed it, please do share it with your friends. Uh, reach out, get in touch, follow James's podcast at Rebranding Safety. Ah, I normally give people an opportunity to shout out, mate. So I'm just going to shout out your business. How do people come and find you? Well, thank you, mate. Um, yeah, so if, if you're looking for kind of consultancy work, um, we run a consultancy called Risk Fluent, um, but it's all run through Rebranded Safety website. So everything that we do is through there right now. So www.rebranding, as in your rebranding or company, rebrandingsafety.com. Um, that's it, nice and simple. In there, there's a button called um, cons- consultancy. You can just click on that, or you can just email me, james at rebrandingsafety.com, and we can have a chat. Um, see what you need. Um, I'm, I'm quite passionate about, like, I'm not a very good salesman. I'm not, I'm not a very good salesman. I'm more like, nah, you don't need me or you can probably do that yourself. So, you know, no no kind of charge. Let's just have a chat. If you've got a problem or you've got a question, we'll have a chat. If I can help you in the call, then, then I will. Also, go check out the podcast and that before you kind of pay anyone, even if you don't pay me. You know, like, go check out the podcast. We've got so much content on there. All the stuff I spoke about today has primarily come from either reading or or, or talking to the people on that podcast. Um, what are they reading? What they've read? What they've wrote or recommend? Or or, or they talk or I talk about them with it on the podcast. So go check that out. And then the YouTube channel. All all of this is called Rebranding Safety. The YouTube channel is Toolbox kind of talks. We call them to kind of stick with the safety stuff. Um, but ultimately, they're just. I say short, but we really struggle because I'm a talker, as we've picked up with your <laughs> longest ever podcast. Uh, we try to keep them down as short as possible. It's really hard sometimes, but some are like 20 minute videos, some are like 10 minutes, some are like five minutes. Um, but all the podcasts, everything's on there and clips of the podcast are on there as well if you want to get shorter ones. Um, and that's probably it, mate. You're so thank you very much. No, you're a star, mate. Everyone, catch you soon. See you next week. Take care. I really hope you loved today's episode and if you did please make sure you subscribe and listen out for future episodes too. Please do share it across your social media channels. We hope to reach more and help more people. If you want to find out more about me my name's Pete Rushmer. You'll find me across any social media channel and my business Flagship Partners and we're your partners in success across your business. Thank you. See you again soon.